you just made a statement that we're going to build Bakersfield to San Francisco. That's not necessarily true um, until we, we do a side-by-side. -side. So how does the side-by-side -side comparison interfere with this schedule? Yeah, my comment was not made uh, in terms of which priority comes first, but the fact that ultimately our, our um, requirement for Prop 21 is to build a segment uh, from from Los Angeles to San Francisco. Ultimately, whether NTP two is is comes before some other segment that that's irrelevant. Eventually, we will have to build um, Bakersfield to uh, San Francisco. The side by side comparison is due. The qualitative analysis is due to this board in September, and we're on target to meet that. So going back to the, um, I guess the one point is that that the successful bidders will in fact probably be this the system wide um uh, constructor for for us for at least v2v yes minimum b2v the the issue of um earthquake warning system mm -hmm. I mean, since we just had an occurrence <laughs> i mean it's obviously very uh, very very pertinent um in one of my visits to japan wrote the system and their geography is very similar to ours, yes. where they have a range of mountains that, that, that seems to have a lot of uh, movement, and it's very similar to California. Uh, and their system is probably very unique in as much as that they um, um, shut down the entire system uh, when they uh, assume there's going to right. be an earthquake right. or, or feel that. Um, but they wanted it to provide only... Uh, the rolling stock and track and systems. Uh, so will that mean that they will not be, pre or they'll be prevented from bidding this? No, 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 no. The, they are not the Japanese. In fact, uh, we have interest from Hitachi uh, as, as part of the uh, uh, request, you know, uh, review of the RFP comments. So they have been uh, engaged with us. However, uh, our system, earthquake detection system, will be designed along the same uh, lines as the Japanese and also the tai Taiwanese uh, high-speed rail. Uh, there's a little difference in terms of how it's controlled, whether it's controlled by the catenary or by the signal system, but essentially the sensors and the, the system is, is very much akin to both of those Asian systems. The, um, when we talk best value, that is always very subjective. Um, is there an objective way that we're going to, to, to limit the evaluation of that criteria is, is, is very key to our, our, our final evaluation on the RFP. The final scoring numbers and, uh, of those individual elements will be presented when we come to ask to go to the RFP stage. However, yes, we will be looking at, at what the proposed maintenance costs versus uh, con you know, um, capital replacement costs during the course of the 30 years and looking for RAMs. Uh, reliability, accessibility, safety, and maintenance uh, targets against capital costs. So all those relationships in terms of costs will be uh, part of the evaluation process for the final RFP uh, and the final award of the, the su successful bidder. So you'll come back to us for each section? Yes. Okay. Yes, we'll be back to you, and we can review the actual uh, evaluation criteria for the RFP at that time. Chairman, thank you for indulging. Thank you. Good questions. Any other questions? Bonnie? Um, I just want a better understanding of, of what the limitations are in terms of contractors that can apply. There has been a recent uh, request by some of the contractors uh, the, that we had to evaluate in terms of conflict. Right now, uh, our legal uh, team has conflicted out uh, <laughs> anyone associated with the construct uh, the the CP1 through four contractors, anyone on, that's on those JV teams, and anyone that's on, on our PCM teams of CP1 through four would be conflicted out because they have superior knowledge of some elements that could influence uh, the bids. Uh, if there's any other subcontractors, they would have to be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis uh, through our legal uh, department. Uh, but right now, the primary uh, contractors conflicted are JVs in CP1 through four and the PCMs in one through four. How quickly are we getting back to them about the conflict? Anyone that's submitted, uh, the legal team gets back to them very quickly. As far as I know, Tom, do you have any comments on that? I mean, I think they've addressed that. Uh, we, we do uh, respond uh, promptly, 
and sometimes there's an engagement back and forth to mm -hmm. obtain more information from the teams so we understand what the structure of the organization is so we can do the you know the proper evaluation and so we, we do have those discussions as well but we we understand the urgency of getting these answers to them because the uh, procurement is coming up so we are we are prompt in that and we've determined that the conflict is are issues raised by the federal acquisition regulation as opposed to policy Yes, yes, and there are uh, uh, grant agreement requirements that uh, require us to look at uh, these conflict issues and the principles are found in both state and, and federal law and case law regarding competition and um, so we, we, we're using all that. We've used uh, outside counsel to assist us as well in the evaluations. Uh, just an added observation uh, here, Mr. Uh, Camacho, is that um, since the last board hearing and the delay in the action on this, there's been industry engagement back and forth yeah. with our staff to go through these issues in more detail and get a better understanding of where this comes from. I think it's really important that we yeah. we don't um, jump into something that we regret later. I think we made for as part of the lessons learned from from the past. Yeah, and if I might add, if if please, um, we we have uh, uh, done this engagement with some of the uh, uh, team members who were at the subcontractor levels, we were able to establish uh, some criteria to allow them to participate by the placement of ethical walls between uh, groups within their companies. So we have really looked for uh, creative ways, which is allowed under our uh, conf organizational conflict of int interest policy, to put those mechanisms in place to allow more competition because we do want competition. So it's more the primaries that are unable to participate. Than right. The That's been the determination is uh, the design builders and the PCMs at this point because um, uh, th their involvement would, um, uh, they, they have uh, non-public information that others wouldn't have. Those are the basic principles and then um, there's, uh, they also give us uh, advice and uh, are privy to, you know, our positions on many issues. And that created, you know, the problem with having them to uh, perform this track and systems procurement as well. Okay, please. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> speaking as a layman here, layperson, I'm a little baffled by it, but uh, it's not really germane to the uh, to the RFQ conversation. But uh, I think one of my very first votes was for. Um, a $700 million award, and in the uh, process of determining the uh, eligible contractors mm -hmm. or, or yeah, contractors, uh, there was 30 points out of 200 awarded for knowledge of the project. <clears throat> now, I know this is a different situation and there's more specifics to it, but it sounds on the face of it like we're excluding people who have knowledge of the project which is what we've been trying to get more and more of, people who know how to build high-speed rail. And, uh, you know, on the basis of having non-public information, I find that interesting. Is it possible that that non-public information could be made public so that nobody walks in the door with information <coughs> that other people don't have, unless there's some kind of proprietary uh, concern about that non-public <coughs> information, in which case, it puts the people who don't have it at a disadvantage in terms of constructing this project. <coughs> and I didn't quite get the other part of it, uh, but I did read the, the original letter, which again struck me as odd that <coughs> they may have inside information that will change the way they perform the job they're doing now based on the contract that they'd be pursuing in the future, <coughs> which sounds uh, pretty fraudulent actually to me. And could be looked upon in a different way than just saying, well, you're just not going to be allowed to bid. So we have to move forward on this uh, measure, regardless of the conflict of interest perspective that we end up with or rules that we end up with. But uh, I just sort of want to emphasize that uh, losing the experience uh, of those who are building our project now uh, on the grounds that that's going to give them a heads up on the next part of the project actually sounds counterintuitive to me. So I'm hoping what you do is the very best possible way is to allow the most 
competent contractors to actually perform the bid <coughs> because if you're basically telling the prime contractors on this project you can't bid on the next portion of the project I'd be reluctant to bid on the next portion of the project as a prime contractor. It's worth noting they'll certainly be eligible for future construction elements of the contract of the project. Right? Okay, so there's a not track and systems per se. There's specificity to tracking systems then that that yeah. uh, is a performance is, is requiring this uh, strict conflict of interest. Somehow that needs to be made a little more clear. Uh, maybe the people who know how to do this stuff understand it, but uh, you know your average person uh, who will be involved in some of the decision making, it's hard to comprehend. So uh, clarification, but also with the emphasis that rather than try to say you, you might misperform, say if you do misperform, uh, you know, not only will you be not invited to uh, participate in the future, you will, will go after you legally speaking. So that, that's one way to sort of address it. But that's just a concern I have. But again, this is not, to me, relevant, no disrespect to this particular vote we're looking at, because that's a mission critical vote, and, uh, you know, leave it at that. I'll make one, we go further, I'll make some comments on that. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, one last thing. The, many of these, at least from, from the industry uh, forums that I've attended, many of these firms have formed consortiums going back two years. Uh, two and a half, three years uh, because of their specialty. So we were probably a little late in notifying them, them, I mean, within 30, 45 days that they're precluded, which then breaks up their team. Uh, um, and so many of the specialty uh, firms are now, uh, which are critical to, to the entire component, are, are left out of this game. So it's um, perhaps we could have done a better job in that area. Okay. Tom. Or Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Vaca, I just want to make sure I understand with regards to the uh, NTP-1, which will be for the 119 miles that is the, the subject of the ARA uh, right. grant. Yep. So when and and again this is downstream because this is all going to come with the with the RFP not the RFQ so I I, I really don't have any issues at all with the okay. the RFQ as far as I as I uh, I am aware but with regards to N, the NTP1 um, will NTP1 be addressed to ensure that the improvements that are required by the grant are what are addressed in NTP1 Yes, uh, the first milestone deliverable for NTP-1 is the arrow requirements of the, okay. of the 119 miles. Okay, and you, you started uh, by addressing what is necessary f to do that. Can you just be clear again, what is it that in, in order to comply with our federal grant, what work has to be done with regards to track? We need a, we need a, a track of the, on the 119 miles. We need a rudimentary signal system and communication system. So a train, any train, can operate on that track. Okay. And is that what we're going to do with NTP-1 then? That is the first milestone in NTP-1, first okay. deliverable. Okay. So uh, then at some later date, th there will be additional work necessary in NTP-1 to, to bring it up to the standards for high-speed rail. One of the that. benefits of combining this uh, all in the NTP-1 is because the design for the entire final product can be done concurrently without and minimize uh, throwaway costs or loss costs. And, and maybe efficiencies can be had to actually put in the final product concurrently uh, with the track as it progresses. So. We are doing everything we can to eliminate any throwaways and maybe build it on an accelerated basis. But at the end of the day, the final milestone deliverable must meet the arrow requirements. But, but that, those additional decisions with regards to NTP-1 will be decisions or suggestions that you all will be discussing whether, and I assume would likely end up coming to the board. Is yes. the, so NTP-1 to begin with will just meet the requirements of the R grant. NTP-1 is the final product. There's a f first milestone mm -hmm. in NTP-1 that meets the ARA grant. Right. Okay. Okay. I think I understand that. The other things that we may need to do to upgrade it, we'll be talking about, it may be they, they may be suggested to be designed initially, but they may exactly. not be put in initially. Exactly. That'll, exactly. Be, that'll come to the board at right. some point. Yes. Okay. And um, 
you've already point, you've pointed out, made clear that the release of NTP1 will be, be clear that that's all we're doing at the outset. Yes. Uh, I just had a the, the the life cycle at 30 years. Is that is is that the life cycle? Is is that the the industry standard? Is no, the maintenance contract is, is picked on a 30-year basis, but each each element has a different uh, life, life cycle. cycle. So so the bridges are 100 years, the rail is about 50 years, but the signal system is about 15. So it's it's done on an element by element basis, uh, and and. and Across the the requirements. Okay, that that's that's what I was getting at. So, yeah. how was the what was the thinking that went into the 30-year agreement, the life of the maintenance agreement at 30 years? So essentially, there's two broad areas of of assets. The more electronic-based assets are are about 15 years. Mm -hmm. So you get a, one complete re rebuild in that 30-year period. The second is the fact that uh, Part of the requirements is that when the infrastructure is handed back to the authority after the 30 years, that there be 10 years of life left in that asset to give us an opportunity then to recapitalize. Uh, so that was uh, that 30-year period is also consistent with the rolling stock 30-year period because rolling stock essentially has about a 30-year life with a 15-year uh, midlife rebuild. So if the if the proposers would prefer to have a longer maintenance period because of recovery on capital in order to improve that life cycle, we would be open to it and the, and the RFP is written accordingly. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tom, if I could just ask you a question then. So with, with, regards to, uh, with regards to what the policy is of this board today based upon its action um, and probably reflecting <laughs> on the 2018 business plan, it's my understanding that the current position of this board by action is the operating segment that we have that we have uh, approved as a board is valley to valley. Is that correct? Yes, the initial operating section right, initial for right. purposes of meeting um, they, they the, the subsidy right requirement in Prop 1A. That's what we had determined through ridership revenue forecasts okay. right. is you'd have to travel from Bakersfield to San Jose right. in order to for the ridership revenue um, 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 ticket sales to pay for maintenance and oper operation if we were to be the operator. Right. Yes. But notwithstanding all of that, I mean, that's currently our policy. So I, as, as, as Director Concha, uh, Camacho and I and the rest of the board members are aware, we've got some reports and studies being done right now. But currently, without a change in direction, that is the direction that the board is, is, uh, is taken with regards to, the fir as you point out, the first operating segment. Okay. Um, I think that's all I've got, Mr. Chairman. And the answer was yes, yes, that's correct. Thank you. Um, did you have well, I got a couple of questions uh, requ regarding the uh, proposal. So uh, two things struck me, uh, Frank. One was the skin in the game. I didn't quite get that uh, <laughs> reference. Because I've, I've be been here <laughs> for a very long time and have felt that we've missed the opportunity to do that in some occasions. Can you clarify what sure. you're saying? The issue is that this proposal will provide us a bid that includes both the capital, the design, the construction, the capital input, and the maintenance for those 30 years. It is uh, incumbent upon that this, the successful bidder to take into consideration that they must minimize the long-term 30-year cost because it's going to cost them. They have a fixed bid on the maintenance and therefore to ensure that they have the best capital construction to minimize their long-term maintenance and, and reduce our life cycle costs is in their best interest financially. So they have a fixed bid for all portions of it or just the maintenance portion of it? We have, well, it's a best value. So it's, it's, a, it's not, they're not separated. So now, it's the best the value. The original concept, as I understood it, and have been arguing, uh, you know, not just at this forum, but everywhere I can, that we need to find a way to get the private sector to pony up with a few dollars because they have the most of the money out there, or maybe not all of it, but a lot of yeah. it. And that usually means some sort of investment at risk. So where, where's the risk factor on this that you're talking uh, about? They have bid the maintenance cost. I mean, they don't have, uh, they're at risk against their proposal. I mean, like every other contractor, yeah, no. uh, they're at risk against their fixed price proposal. And if they don't? We have the same remedies you would have in the design-build contracts. But there's no you know, coming there's back and saying, uh, you know, we have some change order issues here. We have uh, contingency plans. This is what happens in every particular uh, uh, contract we've had because there hasn't been that risk element 
uh, associated with it. And this was the discussion in the early train operator. Uh, and there's still uh, ultimately the authority's business plan and long-term goals is to have a concessionaire where that risk is, is out front and, and is That's provided to us. That's it. We're done, right? More or less. Well, once, no, this is not a concession. Right. And that once uh, the business plan uh, articulates that once ramp up has been completed on our operation and we have a stable operation, then we would envision that we go out for a concessionaire that, it, that then takes responsibility for the entire operation. That does bring me back to the ETO because we really had a pretty, uh, well, at least I remember it, uh, the premise here that there was going to be some uh, private money at risk for the ramp up portion of it. The, the initial stage would be a, a cost, time, and material question. And then there would be a ramp up phase. Uh, this was assuming we were going to get a train up and running. And then there would be a period after it became stabilized to, re to at least uh, uh, make the, the uh, amount of money that was at risk. And so now we have a <coughs> functioning system bringing in some funds. And then we would probably go out at that point to an exactly. open bid. Is that similar? That's Except exactly the, the, the process we're following. Okay, but there's no investment in the front end. There's no investment until you get to the concessionaire agreement, uh, which is about... Through the stabilization you know, portion of it? I, that's after it's stabilized. Right now, the ETO's contract is broken into two phases. Phase one is basically a consulting uh, right. phase, which we're going through today. And then uh, we have to negotiate the second phase, which would be the operation uh, and the term of that operation, how long they would participate as that operator, uh, because at the end of that second phase, at that point, we'd go out with the concessionaire. Right. So when you renegotiate that, and since we're using the early operator, is there then the opportunity to put money at risk? Or how, I don't understand how that works. Do we subsidize that portion of it until it... Until, well, no, we don't subsidize anything. Once we go into operation, it pays for itself. Right. Uh, but once the, we go into operation, <laughs> but there's a ramp up phase. Well, there's a ramp up. But once, once the ramp up the phase risk. is completed, then we, the operation will pay for itself in terms of our O&M costs. However, to extract capital dollars from this operation long term, you then need to let, let a concession where there's, ca where there's dollars returned to the authority okay. for that benefit of long-term operation. All right, well, I'm still a little confused by that, well, to be honest, can, because in, those, in that last early train operator, we did not emphasize anybody uh, investing any capital in the process, yes. which for me is what gets the uh, focus is the mind. Uh, it's right. kind of like a hanging. Uh, you know, meeting your requirements of your bid is one thing, but having a couple hundred million dollars at risk is another thing. We never really have come to grips with, with that. So that, I'm still a little <laughs> concerned about the uh, skin in the game question. And it really is sort of a long term, longer term vision than uh, yes. the FRA requirements here, yes. which is one of my main concerns. Uh, the other thing I heard was the uniformity issue, which to me, uh, you know, again, a simplification of it, would be, would makes a lot of sense when it comes to the train, uh, you know, the uh, electrification and all of the safety systems associated mm -hmm. with running the train. But we're just not really there because we don't, we can, we've already concluded that we're using a building block approach to this. So how do you, uh, what does the, uh, the uniformity mean in terms of uh, the peninsula electrification, which I believe is moving forward to some degree without, without us? Some, I, I assume, uh, and I could be wrong on this, that uh, Caltrain is doing their own uh, electrification process that we will connect to at some point or be a part of. So, so the, the, the electrification uh, on Caltrain, uh, we are ensuring that it's interoperable, interoperable for us. We're, we, we are with Caltrain uh, side by side, ensuring that what they build uh, meets the function that they require and meets the functions that we require for our operation. Uh, and that is, you know, ultimately uh, we are part of their uh, management team in terms of, uh, of ensuring that, that that technical solution is appropriate. Between San Jose and Bakersfield, that is our dedicated right away, and that is the prime reason to ensure that the design that's done in any one section is the same for those other sections. Okay, so the uniformity you're talking about is from San Jose to Bakersfield? Correct. Because then that would exclude electrification in Southern California as well, which may proceed prior to... That's, that's true. Uh, we would just ensure interoperability and the ability of our system, our trains, uh, and our requirements for our passengers are met in, in that area. And that's true in both splendid sections. Okay, well, that makes a little more sense to me than yeah. to have the same team do that. 
Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure it's actually mission critical since we have to do it to connect to the bookends. Uh, yeah, the, the bookend uniform way. The bookends is is you know at slower speeds at the 110 mile an hour speeds. Uh, our our due diligence is to ensure interoperability in those sections. Okay, now I'm, 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 I know that uh, from say Palmdale to, L, to Southern California would be a slower speed. Uh, would no. Bakersfield to Palmdale be a slower speed? Bakersfield to Burbank is at 220 miles an hour. Okay. Uh, only there from are, Burbank. There are uniformity and in yes. connection. Yes, all the way to Burbank. Right. Only Burbank to Anaheim would be a shared corridor, as is San Jose to San Francisco. Okay. So this would not be. Uh, this contract does not go down there. No, it does not. It's, it stops at Bakersfield so we would have at this to solve point. that um, yes. connectivity problem at least in one place. That, yes, interface. Yes. Okay, so that leads me to know that, I mean, if we have to do it in one place, we probably are capable of doing it it's, in another place. It's doable. Yeah. Okay, those are, those are two of the questions that uh, were not clear to me. Uh, right now, that's it for, you know, unless we... Okay. Just want to ask... Board Member Miller, since I can't see you, um, did you have any questions? Can, yeah, I have a couple questions. Is it a good time for me to ask yes, those now? Please. please, go ahead. Um, thanks for the presentation. I have a question on this 30-year maintenance. Um, is that a requirement of our contract? Uh, the, yes, the RFP, our, our, the RFP will be yeah. design, build, and maintain. So is this maintenance obligation that they're responding to contingent upon operation, an operational system, is what I mean? Well, yes. I mean, it's contingent upon the fact that, well, the state will own these assets, and we will have to maintain them uh, regardless of which, which type of operation eventually operates on them. I mean, our plan is, of course, high-speed rail as per our Prop 1A. But at the end of the day, we have, we'll have a, an infrastructure that's built and will have to be maintained. Right, but you're asking for them to give you a maintenance, a plan now that would last for 30 years. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Yeah, and I, I think I asked at the last board meeting, I mean, that's a fairly long term, and we don't know yet. I mean, this is not, would not be coming to play unless we have an operational system. So do you renegotiate at some point, or do you leave yourself some flexibility in case that's necessary. Okay. Well, the maintenance in the next say five years of, right. of construction. I, I understand what you're saying. The maintenance uh, proposal will include fixed cost maintenance requirements, such as inspections. Regardless of whether you run one train or 100 trains, you have to inspect highway bridges. You have to inspect our railroad bridges. You have to inspect. You have to meet federal requirements. So there's a fixed portion of the maintenance. Uh, uh, expenses. Then you have a variable portion, which is really related to the number of trains you operate, and the number of people that open and close the door, or the number of uh, you know, how you use that infrastructure. And, and that's accounted for in, in the proposal, both the fixed and variable cost based on operations. And there will be a scale based on when you run 20 trains, or whether you run 50 trains, or 100 trains, or there's uh, 100,000 people, or a million people. So that scale addresses that variability based on service. Uh, it also addresses other uh, variables that might come into play in terms of, of uh, the main cycle. Uh, time. There's uh, escalation requirements that if, you know, as we build NTP1, it may, you know, obviously that 30-year maintenance cycle starts earlier than NTP6. There's a scale uh, in terms of indices uh, for escalation that can be applied in order to address uh, the, the fact that the bid was placed uh, you know, several years ahead of when the operation actually took place. And similarly with the construction. Any delay in construction for NTP 2 through 6 is addressed through a, a table of values and, and schedule of values and, and indices to escalation. So it's, it's all addressed as part of the RFP. And we can uh, review that with you if you like. Okay. Well, I think my question goes along the line of, I think, what Director Curtin and Camacho were getting at, which is this maintenance issue. Um, is an ability, a flexibility so that you can go back in to renegotiate when something comes up that we're maybe not aware of today once you get to construction and cars and an actual system. 
we will have uh, visibility of all those costs as part of the proposal so that if we do need to go back and talk, uh, we will have those divided out so, uh, so they will be visible for negotiations. But the, the okay, 30, and then 30 year is not part, sorry. Is not part of the, our uh, grant. The no. 30 years is a number that you, that, that industry has come up with. Yes. Uh, Technically, so, the, so the Nancy, to answer your question, it could be five years, 10 years, um, or whatever, uh, but this is, as he put it, to get the skin in the game, so they're committed for 30 years. So it is an arbitrary number. Except that the ARA grant requires Got it. the ARA grant actually requires 20 years. Otherwise, you have to pay. If you do not maintain the infrastructure for 20 years, you have to repay the uh, grant. Okay. I mean, I, I get the 20 years, so that makes sense to me. Thank you for that. I think that's an important point. The, the second thing, the last question I have really on this is um, the issue of um, replacement. Are you requiring reserves, or are you letting them uh, respond to you about how they plan on replacement schedules and how, to, how they're going to bank funds or have capital, a capital reserve to replace things yes. as they need replacement? Uh, they will identify the life cycle requirements for each of the components. Uh, those that are within their realm, you know, within their maintenance contract, they will do. Uh, but finance has determined that we would hold the uh, recapitalization. Uh, that was a decision made uh, at the authority to take that out of that contract. Oh, so we're playing. We're paying for uh, replacement of capital assets. Uh, I would uh, yes. I, the last I remember, and I, I can get back to you to double check that, but I believe we uh, we will be having that fund separately. Okay. Well, it's important to identify what is a capital asset, right, and what what you're expecting them to replace and what we're replacing. Absolutely. That we'll, we'll make sure that that's okay. addressed uh, when we come back with the RFP. We'll make that a clear clear part of that presentation. Brian, does and will you let the board know what what it is that we're Yes. What that is? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Does the does the uh, updated uh, business plan contemplate the cost of a 30-year maintenance plan? It, it does, but it doesn't differentiate between what capital assets are in that maintenance plan. Yeah. To my to my re remembrance, I could be wrong. I think that's right, Frank. That's do, you have a, do you have a better sense of that than I might? On say that again. Can you ask the question? I mean, does the Updated business plan contemplate the cost for a 30-year business plan versus the 20-year. The uh, our, or maintenance plan. our O and M model, which is part of our business plan and is updated at every business plan, includes what the operations and maintenance costs would be for the operation. <coughs> our the, those costs must be recovered as part of the operation and not as part of our capital costs or, or our finances at this point. So it's, it's, and then when we do the revenue and ridership rec models with our service plans, those costs must be recovered under those operations and revenue modeling uh, done. So it is accounted for and it's part of the, of the analysis for the operations well, to ensure Prop 1A compliance. Does the track system contractor bear the risk of sufficiency of the quality of construction of the CPMs? The track and systems contractor will be provided with our design criteria manual and the design basis for the civil projects. And it will also be provided with all of the uh, objective evidence that the CP1 through 4 have met our requirements and that what is constructed has been inspected and meets those requirements. They will be given uh, samples of our doors uh, uh, application, which lists all of the requirements, will list all of the closed loop on, on those requirements so that they know what they are, they are actually taking over. So it is part of that objective evidence that's required for the certification of the system. Yeah. They, get, they actually take that and they're required to design their system to meet our design requires and what they're accepting from the civils. It's a, it's a complicated interface, but it, all the information is there for them. Okay. Thank you. Tom. Uh, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, all these questions certainly raise other things to be thinking about, and I think that those things, uh, many of those things are what you're going to have to be dealing with at the RFP level. Yeah. Yes. So, but things that come, come to mind are uh, you will have had an RFQ, you will have selected, that will be based upon where they think things are going. Yes. Um, 
when you get to the RFP, do you, uh, will there, w let's say for instance, um, thing, well clearly uh, uh, things will become more clear as to what the direction is that we're headed. Um, what if that's inconsistent with this NP, uh, uh, NTP 1 through 6? Uh, may, or what happens if um, there's, we only end up doing N NTP 1? If we ended up doing that, it, I mean, how would you, how would you foresee uh, breaking off a maintenance agreement for 30 years on something that's less than what is contemplated here? Because let's suggest, let, let's say that there is some sort of inaction and we end up going in a different direction. The, the proposal will have the maintenance associated with each section. So if you have to, you know, if it's only on TP1, you know what the associated maintenance is for that section. As you get, you build the system as you release each NTP. So uh, the, again, the, the uh, RFP will be structured so that all that information will be visible, transparent, and be able to uh, address based on if there are changes, critical changes. And consistent with all of our contracts, there's obviously legal uh, address uh, any termination or any, any changes in the contract which is consistent with state law and, and how we uh, let all our contracts. Okay. Okay, thank you. I guess just to the council again, so Tom, at least for the process we're going through right now in, in uh, soliciting the RFQs and through that process, though, as I understand it, other than, you know, we're not really, we're not really assuming any additional liability. I mean, it's when we get to the RFP that we've got to be very careful in what we're going out to uh, f to p potential uh, uh, contractors uh, in what we're asking them to do. Correct, because this is just a qualification stage. Yeah. So. so clearly, Frank, that's where, I mean, this yep. has got to be massively well thought out and, and it's already becoming pretty complex <laughs> and, we, and we haven't even started. <laughs> yeah. Say again, Brian. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, any, any other questions from board members? I, I have one for you, which I know yeah. is, is yeah. Uh, difficult to be precise on, but my, my assumption is based on the industry outreach that you feel that the way the RFQ is structured that you will have sufficient quantity and quality of bidders to make sure we do have a, a competitive environment for those who are choosing to pursue it. We have had uh, interest from a number of parties uh, that are forming teams and that are, have uh, expressed interest, have asked questions, have come to two sessions and uh, I guess I do believe that we have uh, a number of interested parties that will, uh, you know, more than the shortlisted requirement. Okay. What is the minimum? That may be a decision that I the just board will have to make. <laughs> I believe two is the minimum. We'd rather have three and, and short list of three. Would we reevaluate uh, what we're doing relative to this procurement or on the RFQ if, in fact, we only have one or two? We need to look at it, but I think it would have significant uh, consequences on our long term business plan and our approach. We would have to re, re look at how we're doing business, you know, how we've uh, planned this program from the start. Thank you. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Danny, go ahead. <laughs> so this raises another issue that I've been thinking about. Um, since you were talking about the skin in the game, this RFQ, the, the people who bid on this RFQ will be building the risk factor into their contract proposal. That's just the nature of the that's deal. The, uh, that's right. that's like as, as every civil contractor does in every tracking systems. I, I mean, absolutely. I understand that. That's part and of one way to look at that is, you know, if they're willing to invest, and the other way is the, the, the amount their contract's going to be for, or their or, or proposal. <coughs> and then they take a risk with other, other uh, proposers. But the problem I have is, t to me, the mission critical issue here, and, and what we need to prove and move on today is meeting the FRA requirement for the 119 mile track issue. And uh, I'm a little, I mean, I'm ready to go on that almost regardless of the conversation because I know it's mission critical and time critical. But we may be, uh, we may be sort of guaranteeing higher proposals uh, than we might have gotten if we somehow managed to just go out there for the 119 base track and system that's required. So I want to keep that in mind. 
uh, if we if we have too big a vision on this RFQ, we may end up getting uh, a more bloated as opposed to a tighter uh, bid on that mission critical portion of the job. Uh, and to that, I would just suggest that we need to then, the other side of that coin is then the authority starts taking on significant additional risk in terms of interfaces, in terms of design requirements. I that. So there's a significant trade off there. And I, and I do get that. And I, I fully appreciate you know, the motivation yeah. for thinking this through in a logical yeah. way. Right. <laughs> I'm not sure, uh, you know, where that logic actually holds for this specific problem. Understand? Yeah. And, and uh, if, if uh, you know, I don't have any more questions, but if you want to just comment on one more thing, one more time. Okay. Um, before we uh, ask for a motion, Nancy Miller, did you have any other questions? No, I'm uh, I'm fine, thank you. Uh, Nancy, have a pint for me, would you? <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I'm planning on it as soon as... I'll have three for you, Danny. <laughs> yeah, we hear that Dublin accent. <laughs> I'll move to approve, Mr. Chairman. Second. Okay. Any other comments? Right. Call the roll, please. No, I, I, I do. Oh, you do have a I'm comment. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I do want to make sure, because I've mentioned this before, and, and I've actually testified in front of an assembly committee, which was not my favorite thing to do, but uh, I was reading through the peer review stuff, before I came over here, and there's still this question out there that we, we need to, to address, but not in this, this particular motion. I'm for this motion. I'm going to vote for it, but I want to be known that, that we still have to address is the question where to go from here. Um, the peer review group laid out a series of options. I, I'm not sure that's all the options, and they recognize that, that there could be more or better options. But the basic line there was that they put, we're putting the cart before the horse. And it's not necessarily a, a critique of the High Speed Rail Authority. It's just the way this particular project was proposed in the first place. And it's really hard to have the vision uh, that Frank was talking about uh, when it's really unclear how we're going to pay for that and get there. I mean, that's the problem we're facing now. And Part of what they said, and, and I have to agree because they said it better than I <coughs> could do it, but was that we have to take what we're doing, and this would be incumbent on the administration and the legislature as well as this authority, to put what we're doing in the context of the overall rail transportation system in California. And, and when I was testifying, uh, you know, I said it in a different, slightly different way, but the goal of doing what you're talking about is clearly what we all want, but how do we do it? and what's the best way to proceed from here for what's best for California, I think is still at issue, uh, at least for me. And I certainly do not want to hold up the uh, proposal that we have in front of us, but I want to make sure that we do our best to reach out to what will be our partners and get more uh, interesting, potentially interesting concepts of how we could best fulfill the needs of our partners as well as, we, uh, as while we build out this rail system. Uh, you know, it's clear we're not going to get this thing done in one straight shot like it would have been beautiful if the funding was there. And I, again, I fully appreciate looking at it in a larger way for the long-term uh, efficiencies, et cetera. But I think we do have a few things that we have to do that are going to undermine that vision ever so slightly, hopefully ever so slightly. And I think we're still open for conversation on that. But having said that, I'm, I'm, I'm for this particular motion because this is the mission critical portion of what we're doing for the time being. Okay. Thank you. You call the roll, please. Vice Chair Richards? Yes. Director Curtin? Yes. Director Lowenthal? Yes. Director Camacho? Yes. Director Miller? Yes. Chairman Donza? Yes. Okay. Thank you all, and uh, thank you, Frank, for answering all those questions, and we look forward to the next stage as well.